Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, thanks for coming and uh, uh, happy Earth Day. I'm in my fifth year now of uh, giving these talks, talking publicly about climate change, and I've got to tell you, it's been quite a journey for me. When I started out, I thought all I had to do was tell people about the greenhouse effect and climate change and then, and then show them how it's changing right here in Grey Bruce where we're living. And then I thought people would get all motivated and start to do things about it. But boy, was I naive. I found that it's a lot more complex than that. It's not really just about the science. And so this journey of mine has taken me into the fields of sociology and uh, economics. Um, a couple of years ago, I developed uh, the second version of my talk, which was uh, beyond the science. And I talked a lot from an economic and, e and sociological perspective in that. And now we're here in the third version, which is this film and this talk. And uh, what I've titled it now is Our Changing World, The Three Questions. So here are the three questions. What's the problem? Uh, How is it going to affect me? And okay, well, what can we do about it? And so this is how I've structured this talk around these three questions. But I want to start right here, because I wasn't standing up publicly talking about climate change very long before I was running into people that didn't accept what I was saying, and some people who outright denied that what I was saying was true. And this really set me back on my heels. And I've now, of course, discovered that any scientist that's got up stood up in the public and started talking about climate change has experienced the same thing. And so I've, I've just found this study of the, the six Americans that's been underway at Yale University for 10 years now, and it's all focused around this. And what they asked 10 years ago was, was this question, was why was there such a disconnect between the scientific community and society? 97% of scientists understand that humans are causing our climate to change significantly and that we need to do something about it. Yet poll after poll says that 50 to 65% of the people understand the climate change and, and think we should do something about it. And this study um, has branched out into other countries. It started in the States. It came to t uh, Canada in 2011. So I could just as easily call this the six Canadians because we poll pretty similarly here as, as to our American cousins to the south. So let me introduce you to the six Americans. Here's the first one. This is the alarmed. Polls in about 17%. And that's people like me. I understand what it is and I'm concerned and I'm trying to do something about it. Then there's the next two categories, the concerned and the cautious. And they typically make up about 50% of the population. These people accept the climate scientists, science, they, they understand it, but basically they're not doing anything about it at this point. Then there's the next category, the disengage. It's pretty small, but these are people don't know, don't care. And then there's the final two down at the other end of the spectrum, the doubtful and dismissive. They, come in about 28 to 30 percent of the population. They don't accept the climate science as true. Uh, the doubtful uh, don't do it, not really doing anything about it. The dismissive, they're the ones actively working against the scientists and the message that they're trying to bring. And it's, and it's, it's quite interesting that either end of the spectrum is almost equally balanced. And these numbers, they've been doing this research for 10 years now, remained remarkably stable over that period of time. The good news is this group here, the concerned and cautious, has been slowly tracking up. It's about 10% up now from where it was um, 10 years ago. And we made a decision early on in this project that that's the group that we're targeting with this message. That's the group we're trying to motivate. We're not trying to convince them about climate change. We're trying to motivate them to get doing something about it. And we have this belief that if we get enough of these people mobilized, we're going to pass this social tipping point and we're going to start to really make progress on climate change. Well, we're going to talk about what, what Canadians love talking about the weather, <laughs> but it's amazing how many people don't clearly distinguish weather from climate, and it's really quite simple. Weather is right here, right now. It's small units of time and small geographical locations. So it's the weather today, this month, this year, and it's the weather in Owen, in Owen Sound. And our weather here is different than the weather, say, in Winnipeg. Climate is simply the same thing, but at much bigger time and space scales. 
And so our climate um, throughout Canada, or the northeast part of North America, if you like, is largely a single climate, which is different um, than, say, the southern hemisphere's climate, and the climate of the globe. So that's really the only distinguishing features between weather and climate. Even our former prime minister um, embarrassingly got those mixed up. So what is climate change? Well, here's, here's five measures of climate change. It's long-term changes in the atmosphere and the oceans because they're connected. Oceans and the atmosphere are, are a very interacting system. And it's the atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide and temperature. These are tightly linked. When there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the temperatures are higher. Those physics have been understand for about 150 years. It's also variability in the weather. The weather goes up and down, up and down. That high variability can be associated with other periods of time where the weather doesn't vary much at all. And we have really come from a period of very stable weather for a long time, and we're now entering a period of much more variable weather. The next one is extreme weather events. These are these 100-year events, or that's how many people talk of them. I think increasingly they're becoming 10-year events. But these are the big takeout punches. These are the ones that, that cause all this devastation that we're increasingly hearing about around the world. And finally, climate is natural climate change versus anthropogenic or human cause, caused by people, caused by people's actions. So that's climate change. Now this is, I'm a scientist, I've got to show at least a couple of graphs. Um, <laughs> and explain this graph. Each dot is the average temperature. In this case, it's Owen Sound. So this is the average temperature of Owen Sound in a, in a given year. The last one being 2017. So you go back in time and each dot is the average annual temperature in Owen Sound. The heavy line is, is, a, is a running average. It's a way of smoothing out the high year-to-year -year variability and looking at trends. And you can see there's three cycles there. And each cycle as we go forward has gotten higher than the one before. So you get some sense of how our climate is changing. But if you hear a meteorologist say, well, last year was warmer than normal, what does he mean? What do they mean by normal? Well, as classified by the World Meteorological Organization, it's the 30-year average in the, in the three decades preceding the one we're in now. So there is what is calculated as normal. It goes from 1981 to 2010. And every time we shift forward 10 years, this 30-year normal shifts forward. So when we go to 2021, we go now forward from 1991 to 2020. And so that will be our new normal. And I'll show you how this is what scientists call shifting baseline. I'm going to show you how that's been changing in Ontario. So this, this is to orient you as to what I've been doing in terms of climate change. And currently, right now, our average is just around 7 degrees. That's what we consider normal. So 2017 and 2016, they were above average. Well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is climate change is here right now. It's, it's happened quicker than scientists were predicting 20 years ago. And these are some examples. The flooding in Toronto in 2013, July 2013, was a result of um, an atmospheric river, and it's warmer air holds more moisture, but this moisture doesn't get distributed equally, and it gets in these bands they call atmospheric rivers, and when it hits a coal front, bang, it drops an incredible amount of water in a short period of time in a small area. Same thing happened in Calgary that same year. Toronto, that's the number one disaster that they've had um, from that flood, and, and Calgary, I believe, hit a record for the entire country of Canada from, these, from this degree of flooding. Forest fires, the forest fire in Fort Mac a couple years ago, it was incredible. I remember hearing the fire chief interview, and he, he's right near retirement, and he said, we'd never seen anything like this. It just behaved differently. It created its own microclimate. They call it the beast. And last year, southern BC, record-setting year, year for forest fires, and it's because these areas are drying out. They're staying drier longer periods of time. The higher temperatures draw more moisture from the trees and from the soil. We're getting forest fires. Droughts. Um, the drought that happened in the southern prairies, this would be southern Alberta and Saskatchewan from 1999 to 2004, was the longest continuous drought in Canada since record keeping began in 1880. And this drought extended throughout the Midwest. And there was a study that came out of California saying that it was the worst drought in the last 1200 years. That's climate change. 
And then we'll finish with the cold winters. I mean, no one really heard about the polar vortex till a couple years ago. And those cold winters of 2014, 2015, those were extremely cold for our climate at this period of time. And it's related to the melting of the ice in the Arctic. So think of the Arctic as nothing but ice. It's white and it reflects the sun and it reflects the heat. That ice melts. It turns to a dark blue surface. It absorbs the sun. It absorbs the heat. And that's changing the atmospheric patterns. And what's happening is the jet stream is coming, is coming deeper and it's staying longer. So we've had those cold winters. And indeed, that's what's been happening in this delayed spring we've had this year. So those are examples of what's the problem. Well, how will it affect us? Well, again, this is, a, this is moving faster than anyone was predicting. It's, it's here right now. Um, crop failure. This one that we had here in 2012, you will all remember that spring, March 2012. We had three weeks where really warm temperatures. It was mid to high teens. It even went into the low 20s for a period of time. The trees thought it was great. They came out, they flowered, pollinated, boom, cold came back. They lost, I think, over 90% of the crop that year. And the same thing happened three years later, just it wasn't as severe. Crop failure, heat stress, I mean, it's showing up. The one I like is the maple syrup business. I, Talking to a fellow, an old fellow down in Bogner, he's of three generations of his family have been making maple syrup. And he said, John, he said, when I was growing up, we could always count on the third week of March for boil. We'd put our tools down because March 22 to March 28, we would be boiling sap. He said, now we can't predict when it's going to happen. He said, one year it even happened as early as January. And don't we remember the sap was flowing in February this year, only to be shut down. And this is causing heat stress. And one of the measures of heat stress is that the sugar content in the sap is 50% of what it was 30 years ago. So these maple farmers, these maple syrup farmers, have to produce, draw twice as much sap to get the same amount of syrup. Invasive species, well, um, I've picked the uh, black deer tick and the dogs because the Ontario Veterinary Association, they've labeled March as official tick month now. They have a public information campaign called TikTok. Um, but our pets, you know, they tend to get out in the woods and tell them out in the fields and they're getting these deer ticks, which carry Lyme disease. But our kids are also getting it now and people are getting it. Last year there were three cases in Sudbury of school kids with Lyme disease from ticks that they'd got up there. And human health, again, those impacts are here right now. Last year, Grey Bruce Health Unit published a 68-page document on climate change. The impacts on people's health right now, they divided six different categories of health impacts now. And of course, this is only going to get worse as we go forward. So those are some of the ways that climate change is going to affect us. I'll talk a little bit about our climate because this is something that has really resonated with people when we understand this is not you know, just happening someplace else. It's actually happening right here. I have data um, for six locations now um, which stretch from Delhi in the south to Sudbury in the north. This, this spans three and a half degrees of latitude in a, in a fairly tight longitudinal band. So it gives me a really good idea of how our climate's changing here. But what I'm going to talk about today mostly is just here in Owen Sound, to give you an idea, right here in the southern Bruce Peninsula and how our climate's been changing. And my handlers don't like me showing too many graphs, so I'm just going to summarize it like this. <laughs> so I've built this uh, data back to 1880 um, using a combination of Owen Sound and Wyerton data because they shut down the Owen Sound weather station in 2006. But I've been able to build offsets for that, so I'm expressing it as Owen Sound. Owen Sound's a little bit warmer, a little bit drier, that's all. They're highly correlated. Uh, since the 1960s, that's when we've seen this temperature increasing. We're over 50 years now. In fact, we're approaching 60 years of continually increasing temperatures. In that first graph I showed you, you get a sense of it. And just running a linear regression, we see that on average, from the early 60s till now, temperatures have increased by 22%. The five warmest years, you've got to go all the way back to 1921 to find one of them. But then all the rest have happened since 1998, with 1998 being the warmest year. And when we look at these climate normals, which I'll show you a little bit more of in a minute, these 30-year averages, I can calculate those all the way back to 1880. And we're now at the highest normal that we've been in 137 years. So yeah, our climate is changing in terms of temperature. And the story for precipitation is pretty much the same. We've been increasing in our precipitation through that same period of time. In this case, the calculation's a 20% increase. 
Uh, the five wettest years are all since 1976, with 2013 be quite outstandingly wet here as the record in 137 years. And again, our, our climate normals are the highest that they've been since the 1880s. So these are all signs that our climate is changing. And recent work that, is, that has been published is looking forward that we're going to increase the temperature and the precipitation for decades to come throughout the rest of this century and probably beyond. And if we stay on this track we're on now, this emissions track that we're on now, just as an example of how that's going to increase, right now we get um, on average three days above 30 degrees um, a year. By the time we get to the mid part of this century, that's going to multiply by a factor of 10. We're going to go from 3 to 30. That's the kind of impact that's coming as we stay on this trajectory. So here's the normals. I just want, this is the last thing I'll show you on local climate. And I've now I'm, I'm showing you all six locations. So I've taken the average from those six locations, Delhi up to Sudbury. And these combined data said I can only push back to 1921. Temperature's the blue, and that's on the left axis. Precipitation's the right, and millimeters per year on, on, or on, the, on the right axis, temperature on the left. And back here, 1921 to 1950, those were the normal temperatures and normal precipitations when I was a young boy growing up in London, Ontario. And this is what they are today, when my grandson is now in his first decade of life growing up. And you can see that what's normal now for my grandson was not normal back then for me. And this is a clear sign of how our climate has been changing. Precipitation tracking up for the last 30 years in terms of these calculations. Temperatures the last, last 20 years, and I can tell you we're on track to go higher when we get to 2021. So the next thing I want to talk to you about are time and space scales, because this is an important component of climate change that people grapple with. Um, space, most people get the space. It's the globe, really. So the, the, the wood lots we're cutting down here, the forests we're cutting down, the, the fossil fuels we're burning in our home is a global, it goes globally. So it's the expression, what happens in Owen Sound doesn't stay in Owen Sound. It spreads right around the world. And the other is time. Time basically starts and, and goes linearly forward. And that's something I'm going to just talk to you about a little bit because I think it's really important to understand the time scale of climate change. So we start here, I call this the, the geological scale. And what I've done, I've gone back 140,000 years in time, and what I'm showing you is the global carbon dioxide concentration. And you can see, as we go from right to left, it tracks slowly up and then declines again. And that's one complete glacial cycle. They take, on average, about 103,000 years. And we have these data now going back over 800,000 years, so we can look at eight of these cycles over the last 800,000 years as, a, as an example of um, natural climate change. See on the left, we stayed high. 17,000 years in the, in the previous epoch, the carbon dioxide was very constant at around 272 parts per million, which meant the global temperatures were constant, which meant sea levels were constant, which meant glaciers, ice sheets were constant. And then it starts tracking down. The reason these are asymmetrical is because ice melts a lot faster than its forms. So as we go from left to right, we would go right into the Wisconsin glaciation. So 15,000 years ago, <coughs> scientists tell me there were three kilometers of ice here where we're sitting today as part of the Laurentide ice sheet um, at the depths of the last um, glaciation. But about 11,700 years ago, we came out of that and we entered what's called the Holocene, which is the far right of this graph. And for about 12,000 years, again, our carbon dioxide concentrations have been pretty constant, which means our temperatures have been pretty constant. So that's the glaciation scale, and I've taken this up to 1750, the start of the Industrial Revolution. That's, that's natural climate change. And in these 800,000 years, we've never gone above 300 parts per million of carbon dioxide. That's an important metric to remember. Never below 180, never above one, uh, 300. Over and over again, over hundreds of thousands of years. Climate change, natural. And that's the temperature range associated with it. So when we're at the top, we're warmer. And when we're at the bottom, we're colder. And that represents, on average, a five degree range. So when we were in the Holocene here at the right, we were right near the upper limit of the global temperatures based on natural cycling of climate, which is linked into this two degree warming. We'll come back to that. 
The next scale is a society scale. So, I've, so the left axis is the same, the bottom has now changed. Common Era, um, that's uh, AD if you like, zero is the birth of Christ, before Common Era would be BC. And I'm going back here, well I'm covering about 8,000 years here. Back in um, 5,600 years before Common Era, 5,600 years before Christ if you like, the first civilization of Sumer in, the, in what is southern day Iraq, between the Tigris and Euphrates River. Um, most scholars say that is the first highly organized civilization with a writing system and so on. Come over to um, 2,600 years uh, before Christ, they were starting to build the first pyramids in the marvelous civilizations of, of Egypt. Uh, zero was the year Christ was born and there was the start of the Industrial Revolution when James Watt in the 1750s um, developed his two-stage steam engine that really got that industrial revolution underway. And look at the carbon dioxide through this time, how flat it's remained. We've gone from about 260 to 280 parts per million, which means our climate has been very stable. Temperatures have been stable, sea levels have been stable, ice sheets have been stable through the entire development of our civilization over these several thousand years. Well, that's, I call that the society scale. And that's where we are now. 350. That's the level of carbon in the atmosphere that scientists say we have to stay below that to limit global warming to more than two degrees above the pre-industrial temperatures. N now we're over 400 and we're climbing. We had three years where emissions stayed flat. Now last year they started going up again. This is something that keeps climate scientists, climate scientists awake at night. Okay, the final scale I'm going to call the family scale. And it's about a 200 years. And you'll notice I've now changed the axis on the left. We're no longer peaking out at 400. We're going up to 1,000. And the solid line I'm showing you is from uh, data from 1750 up to 2015, the year after the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published their last report, which is where these projections come from. The dashed lines to the right represent four different scenarios going forward to the end of this century. And I've colored them green, yellow, orange, and red. Now green's good. Green means our, our emissions peak and then decline before the end of the century. And that's okay. We, we do that, we'll stay under two degrees. The yellow is a scenario where our, our emissions keep peaking, but we get them under control before the end of the century and maybe we start to bring them down. And that might be okay. The orange and the red, those aren't okay. Those are what we keep increasing our emissions. It's just at what rate do we keep emitting them at? And the bad news here is ever since the IPCC first came out with these climate reports almost 30 years ago now, this is the trajectory we've been on. It's called business as usual. And since this report the last four years, this is the trajectory we're on. It's called business as usual. And that's something else that keeps climate scientists awake at night. So I'm going to put this now on my family. I'm going to talk about five generations of my family and climate change. This is my grandfather, Albert Gustav. He was born in Sweden in 1884, emigrated to Canada, married the beautiful Lula Johnson, and they homesteaded in southern Alberta, uh, near Many Berries, Alberta. Now, they got dusted out there in one of the droughts that was occurring in the early part of the uh, 1900s. And they lost the farm and they moved into the woods of BC and that's where they stayed and raised, raised their family. So he knew about climate change, but back when my grandfather lived, it was all below 350. It was all natural. We was, that was still natural climate change. My father, John Leslie, he was born in 1919. He was actually born in Many Berries, but he grew up in BC and he died in 2006. And he didn't really know too much about climate change till the very end of his life, because I was telling him that he wasn't that concerned. But by the time he died, we're now above 350 parts per million. There's me, John Truman, born in 1950 in Hamilton, Ontario. These were all taken on the days we got married. Um, now, if I live the life of an average Canadian male, I've got another 11 years. I'll see the year 2029. And as you know, I'm very concerned about climate change, and I think we need to be doing something about it. Our firstborn, Jessica Louise, born in St. John's, Newfoundland, 1981. Now, if she lives the average projection of a Canadian female, She'll, she'll go past the middle of the century. She'll see the year 2069. 
And I'll tell you, she's really concerned about climate change because she's a climate change researcher. She's been working in Africa and the South Pacific for the many, many years on uh, climate changes on coastal fishing communities. She and her husband are so concerned about climate change, they weren't even going to have kids. But then nature took over, and they did. <laughs> so our first grandson was born into the world in October 2014. John William now, if he has the average life expectancy of a Canadian male, he'll see the end of this century. And so the message here from the family scale is it's really up to my generation and my daughter's generation to do something. Whatever we do or don't do is going to be what my grandson inherits. And that's the family scale of climate change. Well, we all know what this is. It's a hockey stick. But it has now become symptomatic with the most famous temperature graph ever produced by scientists. And ironically, this was by Professor Michael Mann and his colleagues. It was actually published 20 years ago today on Earth Day. And this sparked what has come to be known as the climate wars. This graph sparked the fossil fuel industry to begin their systematic and aggressive, highly financed campaign attacking science. Michael has even written a book about this, but that's another story for another day. What I want you to look at is the way this graph ends with this tick going up, because that's exponential growth. And that's the next thing I want to talk to you about. Just a brief review. This is a hypothetical example. So on the left scale is some quantity. It could be dollars, it could be bunny rabbits. And on the bottom is time. And so those are steps going forward. It could be years or it could be days. And here in this case, we'll start with one. And then we're going to grow it at two and a half percent every time we go forward in time. So at time step two, you have 1.025 of those units. And you go forward. And after 250 of these time steps, which roughly approximates the time since the first industrial revolution, you end up with 500, one to 500 exponential growth. And this is the first two stages of what we call the adaptive cycle. The first stage is the birth stage. It's where the growth is very slow. Things are being worked out. Uh, resources are being accessed. Uh, structures are being built. And the second stage is this accelerating stage of growth. And that's exhilarating. That's the way natural systems work. Um, anything that's growing exponentially has worked it out and has got the system working well. We're going to come back to this later in the talk. But I want to now talk to you about what scientists have coined the great acceleration as to try and bring this into perspective. And here I'm using gross domestic product. So that's, that's how nations measure, measure their productivity and their wealth. And back from 1750, and you can see we've been growing exponentially. And look at the explosion in GDP. This is global GDP after the Second World War from the 1950s. In fact, the point of highest acceleration in these data was from 1962 to 1972, a 10 year period of exceptional growth. Well, history has shown us when you become more wealthy, you have more people. And so through time, as, as our GDP has grown, so have our populations. And so the global population has also been growing exponentially through this same period of uh, 250 to 300 years. And as we all know, societies run on energy. So more wealth with more people has been burning more fossil fuels and putting more. And initially, like with the steam engine, they were cutting down the forests of Europe to feed the steam engines. They only went to coal when they were running out of wood. And then they found that it was much better anyway. And so these have all been, these have all been um, increasing exponentially with the hugest increases all been in, this last, in the last century and particularly since the Second World War. And we all know that exponential growth cannot continue indefinitely. So the question is, how much longer will we stay on this trajectory? And finally, I'll show you GDP and our energy use per capita. Because after staying flat for hundreds of years, GDP per person didn't increase. We just got more people. It started to rise somewhere in the 1800s. And as we come into the 1900s till now, it's been growing exponentially as well. So our wealth per person has been growing exponentially. It's increased by a factor of 12. And what this shows you is our use of energy has been growing at even a faster rate than the growth of people. And you have to ask yourself the question at some point, how much is enough? And the great tragedy of this is this wealth and this energy use isn't spread equitably across the world. 
Okay, the next subject. Now, don't worry about reading all these little names. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, there's the nine planetary boundaries. And what I want to introduce you to is the concept that it's not just climate change. Um, it's these nine planetary boundaries. I want you to concentrate on the colors, the red, high risk, the yellow, um, increasing risk, and the, and the green is safe. White is we just don't know. And this schematic here, uh, there's an inner blue circle. And so these are Earth systems. These nine planetary boundaries are, are, are related to Earth system processes that these scientists think are necessary for safe humanity's existence. And if we stay inside that blue boundary, if we stay green, then we're okay. And so they're, they're setting boundaries on, on what they can be. If we go past that blue boundary, we enter the yellow. Now we're in increasing risk. Now we're not so sure. Maybe that's not so good. Then there's an outer red boundary. If we go past that, we're in high risk. And now we know we're in trouble with these planetary boundaries. And this is part of the great acceleration. Right now, this, was, this research was first published um, in, nine years ago, 2009. And at that time, there were only two boundaries that we'd crossed. In those nine years, we've now crossed four. And these are the four. Climate change is now on the, has crossed a boundary. Biosphere integrity, which is really the species extinctions that are going on. Biogeochemical flows. This is the huge amounts of nitrogen and phosphorus that our agricultural systems have put into the land and air and water. And finally, land system change, which we could just say is deforestation. And so the point here is that it's increasing and it's not just climate change. And when you start to look at these planetary boundaries, you find that climate change is linked to land use change. And land use change is, change is linked to species extinctions. And the geochemical flows of the nitrogen and phosphorus are leading to all of the above. And so these things are interrelated. And so it's not just climate change. It's these other planetary processes that are Earth system processes. The good news here, the scientists tell me, is that climate change is the one we can do the most about. And finally, there are core boundaries. That's why they're in blue. And the scientists doing this consider if we cross a core boundary, then the, the Earth system is on its way to a new system state. We don't know when, we don't know what it would be, but these are considered core boundaries. So two, they have two core boundaries, they've both been crossed. Yep, keeps you awake at night. Well, at this point I've probably got you depressed. Um, <laughs> or angry, or both. Um, <laughs> I, want, I would talk about these, um, but I think what we're going to do is move on to solutions. But you get the sense of it. Uh, it's bad and getting worse. I think this really summarized what we haven't been doing about it, at least at the national and international levels. Um, the re first report came out in 1990. That's almost 30 years ago. Um, the last report, the fifth one, came out um, in 2014, four years ago. and this. We agreed to sign a pledge to hold another meeting to consider changing course at a date yet to be determined. And as far as I'm reading out there, nothing's changed. Okay, the third question, what can we do? Well, she's awful bad. If you had asked me if it could get this bad, I would have said, no boy. But then it's not that bad. Uh, the good news is we still have time left. Scientists have calculated a carbon budget, so they've estimated how much carbon we can put into the atmosphere and still stay below 2 degrees centigrade. And the good news is we, there's still a budget left. We can still put carbon up there without crossing that 2 degree warming threshold. The th window is closing fast, but there's still time to actually do that. And as I got down, going down the road reading about solutions, it wasn't very long before I bumped into the word resilience. We have to be more resilient. We have to build more resilient communities. And I got really excited about this because I know a lot about resilience. This came out of ecology back in the 1970s. And the, and the architect of this theory, Buzz Hollings, was one of my old profs at UBC. So I've grown up through my whole professional career with resilience. Back then, it was all just related to ecological systems. Now it has spanned into the social sciences and economics. So what is resilience? Well, here, here's the formal definition. I'm not going to read that out. It's basically, if you're resilient, you can withstand a shock and recover. So think if you're healthy and you get the flu. 
you get sick, it knocks you down, you might lose some weight, but you come out the other side. If you're not healthy and you get the flu, you maybe don't come out the other side. And that's a simple concept of resilience. It's to absorb a disturbance because the way the natural system works is disturbances come along. Sometimes it's a big shock, sometimes it's a multiple shocks. And this little stick figure, I think, really helps to demonstrate it. The guy at the top, he's got a good quality of life. Here's a few bumps in his roads. Then he gets a shock. Down he goes, but he's resilient. Out he comes. The fellow at the bottom, ah, his quality of life's not so good. He's not as resilient. When he gets his shock, he doesn't come up again. So that's the concept of resilience and building resilience. So now we're going to go back to the adaptive cycle because this is at the heart of resilience theory. On the left is, is increasing complexity, on, on the bottom is time. And I've already shown you the first two stages. I call them birth and growth. These are the academic terms that are used for this. The third stage is maturation, it's conserve and stabilize. So this is a system that's working well. It's got everything worked out. Um, it's been very successful. And the, as it grew and as it became more successful, it became more complex. And eventually that complexity tops out. And that, that is then a very successful situation. This is all normal. This is part of the normal cycling of things. But the longer that system remains successful, the more complex it comes. It slowly gets more complex. And as it gets more complex, it becomes more rigid. So when it gets a disturbance, instead of swaying, as our example of resilience demonstrates, it resists it. It's just like putting on a suit of armor. And so you repel that disturbance, but it really does slow you down and keeps you and limits your ability to survive. And so eventually, along comes a shock. And with that is the stage four. It's the death phase. And this is all part of a natural cycling. And the good news here is things have to get worse before they can get better. Because if you're resilient, you'll reorganize and innovate and come out the other side. You won't look the same as when you went in, but you will have adapted to these changing conditions. And that's what building resilience is. You could guess from the great acceleration graphs, maybe we're here. And maybe we still got a ways to keep growing. But if you think of the planetary boundaries, maybe we're here. Nobody knows. This is completely unpredictable. But this is the theory sitting behind resilience and resilience theory, the four-stage adaptive cycle. So we have to build resilience. And we're building resilience so we can be more sustainable. And to get, the, to get there, we have to transform. We have to undergo a transformation of society. We have to go from a society of more to a society of just enough. That's the transformation that we'll be heading towards. And to do that, we have to vision a new future. This is by delving into the sociology and behavior ecology. I'm, I'm quoting two people here. One is this incredible Talia Sharat. She's a neuroscientist in England. And she's been studying optimism bias. So they do the brainwave thing where they look at, ask people questions and then look at how the brain's responding. And I took this quote from her. We need to imagine alternative realities, better ones. We need to believe we can achieve them. That's a necessary starting point. And the second quote is from Rob Hopkins. Now, he's a science from permaculture who founded the transition organization. And this is what he says. One of the key challenges with creating a low carbon, more resilient future is imagining what that might look like. Now, to me, dreaming and visioning is a positive thing. I like doing that. And I like imagining and dreaming about a better world, a more just world, a more sustainable world. And that is a starting point. But we're going to need all hands on deck for this. We've got to work top down and we've got to work bottom up. We've got to work with our le world leaders, our business leaders, our moral leaders. We have to work with those people from the top down. But we also have to work from the bottom up. If we wait for governments, it's going to be too late. If we try and act alone, it's going to be too little. So we have to work together. We have to build our resilience together. Now, you're probably saying to me, ah, yeah, academic talk. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Ivory tower. But let me just show you. Give me a glimpse. This is underway. And I just keep thinking of this great um, song from the 1960s, the, um, the, the uh, Civil Rights Movement song of people get ready. There's a train a coming. You don't need no baggage. You just need to get on board. Well, I'll start here with the insurance business in Canada. Insurance Bureau of Canada established the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction at Western Ontario, University of Western Ontario in London. Intact Insurance uh, 2015 developed the, set up the Intact Center on Climate Change Adaptation. This is the message station 
mission statement of the Insurance Bureau of Canada. They want to build resilience. They want resilient communities, and they're working forward to do that. Here's a statement from Blair Feltme. He's the head of the Intact Center at University of Waterloo in, in the fall of 2016. Ottawa and the province, they have yet to understand what's coming down the pipe. They have yet to actually um, make our country's transportation, electricity, and water systems resilient to the threat from climate change. And they have a foundation at University of Waterloo that people like you and me can apply for. We can get money. We can work with big business. And we can work to build resilience and to adapt to these changes that are coming down the pipe. And that's part of working from the top down. We go internationally. Again, there's all sorts of examples. The World Bank, the United Nations, the World Economic Forum. These are businessmen and economists and bankers. And they're all programs that are underway now to build resilience. The C40 city, uh, C40 cities program to, to combat climate change in cities. These are the mega cities of the world. They started out with 40. They're now up over 90. And then the 100 resilience cities was uh, started by the Rockefeller Foundation in 2013. They want to build 100 cities and then resilient cities and then 1,000 and then 10,000. And now that's exponential growth and that's the kind of exponential growth we're going to need. Look at, there's manuals out there. Um, again, this is all accessible. The World Bank produced three reports over 2012, 13, 14. And this particular report dealt with uh, climate extremes, regional impacts, and the case for resilience. The World Economic Forum, so they have the big meeting every uh, January over in Davos, Switzerland, and they do their global risk report. For the last three years, climate change has been the number one global risk to business. And in 2016, they came out with a manual on resilience. This whole manual is dedicated to how to build resilience into business. And the United Nations, not to be left out, they have a pocket guide on resilience. And, and beyond that, they've developed a city resilience profiling program. This was launched in the fall of 2016. And they have developed a tool. It's called the Cities Resilience Profiling Tool. It's an Excel spreadsheet that you and I can get and work with our counselors and work through that and find out right here in Owen Sound how are we resilient and how are we not resilient. And these are tools. And these are coming from the top down. And the bottom up, well, there's a lot of initiatives from the bottom up, but this is the one that really speaks to me. It's the transition town movement coming out of the United Kingdom. Here's their, here's their statement of what they are. It's a grassroots community project that seeks to build resilience in response to energy insecurity, climate destruction, economic instability by creating local groups. This group started out at one town in southern England in 2006, 10 years later, it had exploded to 1,400 initiatives around the globe. Now, that's exponential growth, and that's what we want to see. When that happens, you know that they've got something worked out. You know that they've, they've got something that's working when it gets that, level, that degree of adoption so quickly. And we have them right here in Ontario. I mean, this is an example of the current initiatives. We have a little one in Owen Sound that started up two years ago, a fledging group of us. There's one in Meaford that's been around longer than us in Collingwood. Um, the, one, the two that I'm most familiar with are Guelph and Peterborough. They've been underway for a number of years now. Uh, the Guelph one, our group is interacting with. Some of our people were just down. They had a week-long resilience festival that they held recently. And so these are transition movements underway right now. And the manuals and the documentation they have to do this is extensive. Any question you have about how do we do, it's in the guides. And these are available, you can download them. So if you're in a community and you don't have a transition initiative, you can start one, bottom up. Here's some examples of, uh, of, of what that actually is to show you, you know, how they're working forward. They have longer lists than this, but there's, there's in the guides of going forward, building energy security, water security, food security, energy descent. We can't just get, go to renewables and get off fossil fuels. We have to start using less energy. We have to develop lifestyles that use less energy and local currency. So these are examples of, and, and really, if you package it in a word, it comes down to going local. Uh, I call it localism, would be a good summary for the transition. And this was really exciting. This just happened last year. So the Stockholm Resilience Center, this is the leading institution in the world on resilience thinking. These are the academic people. These are the theorists. They found that they're pretty good at that, but they weren't quite so good at applying it. And so they've now teamed up with the Transition Network because 
they found this explosion in the transition network is, is feet on the ground, people doing things. And so now they've formed a partnership to work together. Uh, to, I think this has a bright future. If you look around um, building example, uh, examples, I, every time I look around, there's tons that are going on right here, right now, bottom up. The Gray Bruce Sustainability Network, a fantastic organization that's with sustainability projects throughout Gray and Bruce County. Uh, Blue Water Trading Community. We have our own currency right here called the Blue Buck. These people set it up about four years ago and it's patterned after the Saugeen Trading Company or the Sawbuck. And I think they celebrated their 25th anniversary last year. So we have local currencies right here. Uh, the Eat Local, this food cooperative that started three years ago, four years ago, they'll deliver local food right to your door. And if you live out of town, they'll drop it off for you. The Reconciliation Garden, um, building partnerships with First Nations communities is recognized absolutely necessary going forward because the, the understanding now of the importance in culture as we go through this transformation. It's not just the ecology, it's not just the sociology, it's not just the economics, it's also culture and values. And we've looking at these Aboriginal First Nations cultures that have been around for thousands of years. Take Take Australia, 40,000 years of oral history there. And many of those languages and cultures have survived and are, and are, and are regrowing now. I know, I've been there to Queensland. I've, I've actually seen this. And we actually, we filmed at the Reconciliation Garden last year, forming partnerships. Uh, the transition, the, there's one in Meaford, that's their banner from their page and our little logo. Canadian Mental Health Association, many of you will know that they have a, a community garden that's now a, 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 a forest garden. Did I say the right word? Food forest. Food forest um, that came from funding from Aviva, an insurance company, right here in Owen Sound. The Community Foundation, Gray Bruce, now they do a lot of good work, but the one that really captured my attention was when they funded the Vital Signs Report two years ago. This is based on indices of well-being. This is how we're going forward. We're not, we're gonna abandon GDP as our single measurement of how well we're doing. And we're gonna go to these indices of well-being. And here's our group. We can see right here in Owen Sound, our Vital Signs Report. And blue communities, we have a group of water watchers that are moving to make Owen Sound into a blue community following the Council of Canadians in the United Nations. And, and we've got two of the three steps done so far. Now for energy security, I had to go all the way down to Woodstock. But there's a beautiful example down there of an energy cooperative that's just launched last year. Community owned, community run, building local energy but they're also building local um, distribution systems, microgrids, so that the energy that they're creating stays there. And this is a beautiful example of building local security. Energy. Now, I, I hope when you're looking at this, you're thinking of all the things I haven't mentioned, because I'm running out of time, and because I don't even know everything. And so this is where we're saying, you know, work with us. But it's already started. These things are already underway. One of the challenges here, I think, is bringing these many groups together with all their, you know, um, overlapping and similar interests as we go forward. So I, I end here with, a, this is a slide from that Tali Sharat, the neuroscientist. We, we uh, can't just be like penguins at the edge of a cliff hoping we can fly when we jump off. <laughs> We've got to build a parachute and that parachute is the resilience transformation sustainability theme. And if I end it with one thing, the climate scientists, the great climate scientists in the world say, if there's one thing we can do about climate change, it's to talk about it. So let's talk about climate change. Thank you very much. <laughs>